For example, in the formative years of the uh, Republic, there was the law of Hat, Hat Revolution, according to which um, Islamic uh, style of uh, headgears are prohibited. Only Western style hat can be worn. Also, in 1934, there was the dress code which prohibited religious gown and hijab and all those religious symbols from being worn. Uh, <clears throat> also, there was the law of uh, uniting the education, Tevhidi Tedrisat, which is shutting down all the religious schools, such as madrasas and other religious schools that existed along the secular style schools during the Ottoman times, but now they were shut down. All education must go through secular education. And also there was the law of foundations, which, uh, which uh, abolished the Ottoman uh, Ministry of uh, Foundations, Efkaf ve Sharia Vekaleti, which aimed at controlling the financial sources of uh, these religious groups. So now today, uh, people, religious uh, people in Turkey are discriminated as well. Until recently, uh, for example, a woman with a headscarf couldn't attend university in Turkey. For example, Prime Minister Recep Erdogan, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, had to send his daughters to the United States for university education. Uh, they tried to make some constitutional changes, but the Constitutional Court refused. But nowadays, de facto, the universities are tolerating, in a sense. That is, for example, at Hacettepe University, we can see students wearing a hijab, turban, coming to school. They are not excluded. But on the legal basis, there is no change yet. Um, Lastly, I would like to talk about the non-Muslims. Non-Muslims, before the First World War, in 1914, their, uh, rate, uh, their uh, numbers, figures in population were around 20% out of like 15 million people in the Ottoman Empire. By the end of the First World War, they were around 3%. So what happened during the First World War, you know, is a big debate. Armenians were forced to leave, and there were mass killings as well. And uh, Greeks, there was a population exchange between Turkey and uh, Greece after the war. Greeks left in this way. Armenians left another way. And uh, by the end of the war, as I said, only 2%, 3% of the population were non-Muslim. But during the formative years of uh, the Republic, even this tiny percentage were forced to leave. There were different, uh, 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 different things. Uh, like uh, there was the uh, taxation of estates, varlık vergisi. Uh, which forced uh, the Jews and Christians to pay huge sums of uh, money, tax, to the state, which of course they couldn't pay because it was unbelievably uh, high. They were forced to work at the work camps uh, in response, you know, when they failed to uh, pay the tax. You know, of course, when it turns out that, and this, uh, this took place in 1942, and you know, when it became obvious that the, the Western world was going to win the war, of course, the state wanted to try to come to terms with them. But of course, these people lost their confidence totally to the Turkish state. And afterwards, they left. When the Israel was established, many Jews left. Greeks left for Greece or for the United States. Now, in Turkey, there are about 3,000 Greeks. You cannot believe it. And there were millions of them. 
before the uh, First World War. Around 50,000 Armenians left, around 10,000 Jews, I think, uh, Syriac, uh, Syriac uh, Christians, there, they are also around five to 10,000, very few. Many of them left. For Sweden, for example, there is a big community in Europe now, Syriac uh, uh, Christians. Now, I think the best policy of the Turkish state towards all these groups should be the policy of toleration. The state should abolish all the prohibitions towards these people. For example, education is one of the things that Kurds want in their own language, and it's prohibited. It should be allowed, that is, it should be free. Many Turks may not like it, but if we respect a person's right to be educated in his or her own language, you should accept it, you should tolerate it. The state should abolish the ban. And uh, also, uh, with respect to Alevis, if they don't want to get the education, you know, if they don't want to be taught Sunni Islam, you cannot, you have to respect their conscience, you have to tolerate. You should leave them alone, and you should respect their places of worship and accept if they think that this is a place of worship, it is not up to state to decide whether it's a uh, place of worship or not. If they say so, it is. So, and with respect to non-Muslims, again, their real estates have been taken by the state in the, throughout the 20th century. Lots of real estates. Very recently, there was an orphanage at, uh, uh, at Heybeliada, uh, that, no, I, I think Büyükada, uh, another island in Istanbul, uh, that was given back to the uh, Orthodox uh, Greek community, which, was, which had been taken by the state for a very long time. It's a beautiful building, and uh, it was uh, not being used. It was uh, being demolished almost. So all these things should be given back, and they should be left free to, and as equal citizens, to experience their differences in their own ways. The state does not have a duty neither to promote nor hinder those differences. The only duty the state has is to protect. I think that's all uh, that I would like to say right now. Thank you.